volume, I think, um, complete volume in English of St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, Treatise on Law. It has all the sections of the law in, in uh, his Treatise on Law in one volume. I hope you enjoy it. And thanks very much for inviting me. This is a real honor for me. As uh, Luke indicated, the first time I spoke at the Lyceum was about uh, almost two years ago. And I have to confess that I was oblivious to the Lyceum, and no longer, because I am its biggest fan. If any of you think you're the fan, the biggest fan of the Lyceum, you are wrong. I'm the Lyceum's biggest <laughs> fan by far. I try to promote it as often as I possibly can, because it is a jewel. Um, would that we had more of these types of institutions throughout the country. I think that the country, despite the fact that the economy is doing spectacularly well, the best in my lifetime at least, there's a lot of concern about what's happening in this country. It goes beyond political concerns. It goes beyond temporal concerns. Luke indicated that I had written a statement for a report of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights that expressed my alarm at what was transpiring in this country. Um, from the standpoint of the suppression of religious liberty, for those of you who think that religious liberty is under assault, you're not mistaken. Um, well, let me riff a little bit, a few things that came to mind. I, I was going to speak about, as um, I, I think some of the promotional material, materials said, um, the importance of a classical education and religious liberty. Uh, I very often, as by the way, seated at this head table here is Carol Sornak, who is my longtime secretary, um, who probably deserves a round of applause for having to bear with me <laughs> for a number of years she was my secretary because I have a ridiculous schedule and I make ridiculous demands and she met all of them. She was the perfect secretary, a uh, really remarkable person. law full-time, but I'm on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. I was a member of the National Labor Relations Board. I write novels. I'm on the radio, I'm on television. I do all kinds of other things. So to manage all those things and to make sure that I do so in a timely fashion is a difficult proposition. I'm here to talk about the importance of institutions like the Lyceum. And I focus on the Lyceum. I mean, the broader speech has to do with the importance of religious liberty and how classical education, grounded in Western civilization principles, and most particularly Christian principles, and Catholic Christian principles, really is, I think, the lodestar for making sure that the greatest nation on earth continues to be the greatest nation on earth. But we're under, as I indicated, withering assault. We're on a continuum that begins with religious freedom, continues on to intellectual freedom, and then goes to free speech. It doesn't end there, but that's the tripod of our essential freedoms. I was told by Professor David Forte, who is an expert on matters related to religion, and I didn't know this, to my chagrin, that the First Amendment, religious freedom, was originally the Third Amendment. I didn't know that. And I'm embarrassed I didn't know that. I'm a lawyer. I also study this, and I'm a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. I have been for nearly two decades. Uh, I'm going to be on probation soon, I think. I'll be on parole to get out of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. <laughs> <laughs> but the founding fathers fully understood that the institution that they were creating, and it was an institution, that's what they believed. It was a country, but it was an institution institution founded on the governing principles of Western civilization was grounded in and could not exist without the First Amendment. And when you think about the, the various aspects of the First Amendment, we usually think about free speech first, right? But freedom of religion is what informs everything that follows and everything that precedes it. And I can go on for hours and hours, but Luke said I had 20 minutes to talk. <laughs> so I want to just cite a few things that happened in just the first couple of days of this week and maybe a couple of days of last week. 
that will let you know where we stand today. And it's a little alarming. I know it's Saturday. We want to have fun. I don't want to distress anybody. Actually, I'm pretty optimistic. But there are things that are happening that I would suggest we should be vigilant about. And the folks in this room are just the type of folks that understand the importance of that vigilance. What distresses me, having served on the commission and being all over the United States and talking to the members of the state advisory committees of all the 50 states, the Civil Rights Commission's state advisory committees, is that there is a blindness, if you will, as to the assault on religious freedom, intellectual freedom, and free speech. Continue. Just in the last couple of days, at the University of Texas, San Antonio, students there who were pro-life created an exhibit to express their concern about the institution of abortion. And the exhibit had 911 pink crosses that signified the number of daily abortions performed by Planned Parenthood alone. Now you would think that at an institution of higher learning, which should be a space for free speech, where not just the professors and the administrators, but the students would protect the right to free speech, champion it, and permit people to speak, regardless of your given position on an issue. Instead, their exhibit and their demonstration was disrupted in the most vile and obscene ways. Without, apparently, and I'm looking at this, I don't want to necessarily make representations that aren't true, but in every report I've seen, without any intervention by the school itself. And it was interrupted in this fashion. The crosses were pointed to, maybe some of you remember, those of you who are of the Vietnam era generation may remember a protest song that said, hey, look, what's that sound? Remember that? Yeah. Hey, look, what's that sound? And what they said was this. They kept singing this in the presence of these 911 crosses. Hey, look. What's that sound? All the fetuses in the ground. They pointed to it and laughed at the crosses and said, hey, that's my abortion right there. Abortion is good. Abortion is great. Regardless of where you stand, I don't care if you're a Catholic, Jew, Protestant, atheist, there's something fundamentally twisted about that. And yet, on a regular basis, peaceful protests by religious are interrupted or prevented by institutions and students. K. Cole James, who I know, used to be the head of the Office of, Professional, or, uh, Office of Personnel Management, a huge institution within the federal government. Mick Mulvaney had, for a period of time, been the head of it. It's a big and important position. She was also on the board of NASA, the advisory board of NASA. She was also the dean of Regent University. In other words, a serious person, a smart person. She was nominally invited to be on the board of Google until such time as some social justice warriors at Google found out about it and raised a big stink about it, and her invitation was rescinded. Why would someone so august have her invitation Rescinded. Was she somehow a criminal? Was she incompetent? <clears throat> what was the reason? The reason is because she held a traditional view of marriage. So her invitation was rescinded. Some of you probably know who Roger Scruton is. Roger Scruton is the premier philosopher in all of Great Britain, and I would submit the premier philosopher in all of the world today. Brilliant man. He was serving on an advisory commission for Great Britain's housing authority. He was thrown off of that housing commission in the last couple of days. Why? Not because he's an idiot. He's probably the smart, smartest person who ever served on that commission or any commission in the history of Great Britain. He was thrown off of it because he's a rigorous thinker. 
He's a classical thinker. He is not politically correct. That's unacceptable, apparently. Not just in today's America, but in Western civilization as it is today. Chick-fil-A. How many of you like Chick-fil-A? Everybody does. If you don't like Chick-fil-A, get out. <laughs> now, this is something I know a little bit about, not just because I eat Chick-fil-A, but uh, I was involved in these controversies. Just in the last few days, actually the first time it occurred a couple of weeks ago, the city of San Antonio and the city of Buffalo's port authorities rescinded or banned Chick-fil-A from having a concession at those airports. The City Council of San Antonio said so because we cannot have the bigotry of Chick-fil-A that would represent an unwelcoming environment hmm. to our travelers to this country, to this city. Buffalo and New York State Assemblymen said, we can't have Chick-fil-A here. Now understand something about this. In Buffalo, they were revising their concessions because the traffic at the airport was not patronizing the concessions that were currently there. The food was horrible. And everyone was excited when they found out Chick-fil-A was going to be there. The Port Authority was championing it, saying, we finally got Chick-fil-A. Until some New York State assemblyman found out that Chick-fil-A is going to be there. And he reads all the right blogs and newspapers and found out that well, let me preface it by saying they were banned because of the bigotry of Chick-fil-A. Understand something, though, with respect to bigotry. If you go to the EELC's website, you can do this. There are approximately 70,000 charges filed with the EELC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that addresses matters of employment discrimination. You won't find any discrimination charges filed against Chick-fil-A. They're a model institution. Nobody complains about Chick-fil-A. Their employment practices, how they treat people, none of that. You can see discrimination complaints filed against similarly situated fast food places, but not Chick-fil-A. But they are bigoted. Why are they bigoted? Well, this New York State Assemblyman believes apparently are bigoted because the foundation, not the corporation, but the foundation of Chick-fil-A that distributes charity to a number of different organizations. And Chick-fil-A's founder, Mr. Cathy, contributed to vile organizations, hateful organizations. I don't see anybody raising their hand asking, what's that organization? Is it the Klan, the Nazi party? Salvation Army, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, these are the organizations that are no longer acceptable in contemporary society. Yale Law School. Again, I was involved in this one. Yale Law School, where all the smart people go, in the last few days said they were no longer going to provide stipends to Yale Law students who work as interns in certain places certain hateful places. Okay. What were those places? Well, there was one that was named. It looks quite familiar with them. The Alliance Defending Freedom. I know that organization because I deal with them on a regular basis on the Civil Rights Commission. Hateful? I never found one hateful person in that organization. They're outstanding lawyers. They happen to defend First Amendment principles. The ability to practice your religion as you deem fit. Yale doesn't think that apparently. So, if you want to work for the Alliance Defending Freedom as an intern, you get no statement from Yale. Historic statues, monument, plaques, commemorations are being covered up, destroyed, or removed from public places and college campuses all over the country at an alarming pace. Now, I know that the folks in this room, because of your support for this institution, and the fact that some of you send your kids here, understand how alarming that is. 
because in many places around the world and throughout history, but most importantly in the 20th century, what we have seen as an initial step toward totalitarianism is the erasure of historical monuments. Keep that in mind, the erasure of historical monuments. The purported reason why these monuments are being covered up or removed or destroyed is because the individuals depicted, whether it be a Confederate general or a founding father, held opinions that today are considered unsavory. As if today we are all perfect. These are giants. These are individuals who helped create this country. But more importantly, it's history. It's reality. It's something that occurred. They're erasing facts. Those of you, and I know the bishop knows this, anyone who comes from an Eastern European country can tell you, folks, we've seen this movie before. Don't go there. Because in totalitarian regimes, one of the first things they do is try to erase history. Stalin did it all the time, Lenin did it all the time. You can go through history books, and you will see photos of Stalin and Lenin next to somebody, and then that person became disfavored, and then subsequent history books, that person will be gone, as if he didn't exist. Remember, prior to 9-11, before we found out, before most of us realized what a threat radical Islam was before Osama bin Laden, many of us were horrified when we saw those pictures of the Taliban dynamiting those giant ancient Buddhist statues. Remember that in Afghanistan? We're doing something very similar. I'm not comparing any of us to, or any, any of our Americans to the Taliban or to Lenin or to Stalin. That's not my point. What I'm saying is, it's a slippery slope. The United States of America is better than that. We should be nowhere near that. We shouldn't be tolerating anything that even approaches that. But now, many of our cultural betters do that willingly and sometimes flippantly without understanding what is happening when you do that. You're denying reality. You're denying history. And you're setting us on a dangerous trajectory. Some of you probably know individuals who have been disinvited from college campuses, may have had job offers rescinded because the prospective employer for the college figured out that that person held traditional religious views. Friends of mine, you may have known of, of there's a person by the name of Heather McDonald, one of the finest scholars in America, brilliant. <clears throat> Absolutely brilliant by any measure. Charles Murray, another person. Well, I don't know if he's Catholic, Jewish, whatever. He could be completely secular, but the man is brilliant. They have been disinvited from a number of college campuses. Others have, too. I speak at college campuses fairly often. I debate a lot, not as much as I used to. By the way, this is something just as an aside. Because I do a lot of oral arguments in my practice, I like to keep sharp by doing debates. I will debate anybody, anywhere, anytime, whenever I get a chance. I used to have a lot of those debates 25, 30 years ago. They got fewer and fewer and fewer. And there's a reason for that, and I wish I had more time to get into it more deeply. But certain people don't want to debate anymore. They don't even want the opposite side or that idea to even get a hearing. Your side could be completely wrong. It could be dismissed by the audience, but they don't even want the audience to hear it anymore. That's stunning. That's unacceptable in America. But it's happening with increasing frequency. It's almost the norm. I asked a number of people, such as a Heather McDonald and others, in a blast email several months ago, whether or not they experienced the same dynamic, and each person said the same thing. The first time I really realized this was going on, because I'm not that, that smart, was about three years ago. I saw a radical shift. Whereas the debates were getting fewer, now they're disappearing completely. I have had, in the last year, seven debates scheduled. 
The ones that were canceled when I showed up at the various universities, my opponent was not there, never showed. Because they don't want certain opinions to even be heard anymore. This is extraordinary. That's not America. And I'll get to why I think we've gotten there in a moment. But one more thing. This last week, some of you probably heard that there was a hearing before one of the House Oversight Committees in Congress. Now, as you saw from that scary picture and all that other stuff on there, I testified before Congress fairly regularly. I'll be there again in about a week and a half. And every time I testify, I stand there and I go like this. And I swear an oath. And the oath always ends with, so help me God. Or words similar to that. So last week in a House hearing, the witnesses stood and were about to pledge their oath. And the one thing that was eliminated by the chairman of that committee was, so help me God. You may think that's small, but it's part of the gradual erosion of faith in the presence of God in our public life. It's not a good thing for a lot of reasons. I don't have enough time to go into it, but I'll cite a few. Let me give you a couple more, because this stuff really... My alma mater, a place that I disgraced for about four years. <laughs> my daughter went there to rehabilitate the family name. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by my old football teammates. We still communicate almost every other day. My last email, about 60. And because they know that I am like the resident crank, they always ask me to do something. Well, at Cornell, an alum who was 89 years old, graduated in 52, huge donor, came to Cornell and gave a speech to the students there and talked in very friendly terms about what he experienced at Cornell when he was there and said he saw some of the great black athletes who were prohibited from, for a long time, from participating in various sports at Cornell. Some of the old Negro League baseball players would come there and play or practice. And he described Jackie Robinson and others that he had seen also. And during the course of his presentation, he referred to these athletes, the baseball players, as Negro baseball players. By like today's standards, I suppose that's politi politically incorrect, but it was accurate because they were from the Negro League. That's what it was called. And I can tell you that in my lifetime, the polite reference to blacks has morphed from colored, that was used to be polite, to Negro, and that was from maybe 1957 to about 1967. Then it became black to about 1987. And then Jesse Jackson decided he was going to change it all and it was going to be African American. Personally, I use black because why use seven syllables when one will do? <laughs> In addition to which, I can't tell you how many times I've doubled over in laughter watching like the Olympics where some sportscaster talks about a black sprinter from Britain as being an African American. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, his accurate reference to these players as Negro from the Negro League caused an uproar. This kindly man who's contributed to this institution, who came there to tell me his experience and what he saw, who was praising these black athletes, he was the subject of considerable opprobrium because his use of a politically incorrect term. That's madness. That's why something like the Lyceum's lawsuit against South Euclid is so important because it represents truth. The important
importance of a classical education is because it is grounded in reality and the ability to think critically. What impressed me so much about the Lyceum is that the classical education here is extraordinary. It, the students here, all these students here, who think, boy, I wish I hadn't been forced to sing at the Force Cor Force Choral. <laughs> You're getting the best education I've seen. I have been to every Ivy League school. I believe that your education is superior to theirs. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and your parents should be commended for sending you here. In addition to which, I've said this before, and I see it with every opportunity I can. The schools I've debated at, I've debated at, you know, University of Chicago Law School, Carnegie, you name it. Name the institution, I've been there, I've debated, and afterwards the student asks, students ask questions, or during a presentation, when there isn't a debate, the students ask questions. And when I was at the Lyceum and spoke there a year and a half ago, the questions I got from the students were the best questions I've ever gotten. These are 7th, 8th, and ninth graders that were asking more erudite questions than one or two year law students at University of Chicago. No disrespect to them. They were asking good questions also. These guys were asking better questions. <laughs> so I was so stunned by this. I said to Luke, how is this, how is this possible? Although I knew the answer. Because I've been studying this for a long time, especially on the Civil Rights Commission. The value of a classical education grounded in Western civilization and Catholic principles exceeds and is superior to any other kind of education anywhere, period. And this institution is faithful to that. It is so important. That's why it's a gem. What we have now are a lot of institutions that teach a lot of facts. There are a lot of smart people at these institutions, but there's a difference between teaching facts and teaching truth. There's a difference between smart and wise. We have a lot of people who know facts. We have a lot of people who are ostensibly smart, but fewer and fewer who know the truth and who are wise. Our institutions are scrubbing those things out of our students. To the extent they arrived at a university, Knowing certain eternal verities, those eternal verities are now seen as being offensive. They don't comport with the politically correct fads of the day. So anyone who harbors these thoughts, who dares speak these thoughts, are treated as pariah. Now, Catholics, Christians generally, are the most persecuted group in the world right now. You won't hear that from the media, who think that, of course, I mean, you name it, almost every other group they champion is being persecuted, and we're now immersed in victimhood to the extent that if you are a victim, you're seen as a hero. And as a victim, your words are superior, your thoughts are superior to those of anyone who has thought critically about a particular subject. But as we saw with the Sri Lanka bombing, if you take a look at the data, Christians are under assault. Why do I say this? Because if you do not have a classical education, if the leaders of our governmental institutions don't understand these matters, if they don't have a classical education, such as that received by the students at Lyceum, they won't defend the eternal verities and they won't defend the institutions that promote the eternal verities. You hardly ever see Western countries coming to the aid of Christians persecuted, not just in the Middle East, but throughout the world. They will come to the aid of all kinds of other groups, and they should when they can. But why are Christians, and more particularly Catholics, singled out for abuse in a program? No one defends them. I would submit because Catholics, Christians generally, but faithful Christians and Catholics stand in the way of a broader enterprise. Now, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. I mean, I put my tinfoil hat in the closet a while ago. <laughs> but I serve on the Civil Rights Commission. 
And when you serve on the Civil Rights Commission and you get all this input from witnesses and have been on the Civil Rights Commission for almost two decades, it starts to dawn on someone with even a little peanut head like this that this is not happenstance. There are coordinated efforts, very sophisticated and coordinated efforts to suppress true classical education, to suppress religious liberty, because religious liberty is the foundation for all of Western civilization. And Western civilization, contrary to our betters and much of academia, is what made the United States great, the greatest country in the history of the world. It's not a perfect country. That's another thing. It's not perfect. That doesn't, perfect is not the same thing as great. Okay? You can be great and not perfect. Muhammad Ali was the greatest, right? Well, he wasn't perfect. I would submit to you that the derogation of a classical education goes beyond merely not being able to count correctly or to come up with some type of theorem. It goes to whether or not you can perceive reality and truth. And if you deny certain truths, if you can accept absurd propositions, then you can accept a lot of the things that some people today are trying to foist upon us. We know they're not true. We can think critically and know that they are not true. But if you've been immersed in the education that so many of our children are receiving today, if you're immersed in today's culture, you can't distinguish between truth and unreality. And that's a dangerous proposition. Stalin knew it, Lenin knew it, Mao knew it, almost every totalitarian knew it throughout history. So, how long have I been speaking? I don't want to keep going and boring you folks. <laughs> Luke was telling me about the plays that the students put on. Shakespeare. All the classical plays. The things, if you read, we have the great books at my house. And I'm not smart enough to read all of them. I don't understand half of them. You know, I, I go through Caesar's commentaries from time to time. I go through, I've, I've read, you name it, just about everybody. Um, Plato, uh, Aquinas, Augustine, all these folks who had these, these grand thoughts that were the foundations of Western civilization. I don't understand what they're talking about, but some of it seeps into the little peanut brain. We're not teaching those anymore. Instead, we hear from folks who have no pedigree whatsoever in terms of critical thinking but they are contemporary thinkers. We, instead of listening to or reading those people who thought profound thoughts, today we're listening to Lilliputians. I'll give you an example. At Yale, today, you can get an English degree without ever reading Shakespeare. That is replicated throughout the country, and not just in English. Think of the great thinkers in any subject matter, anything that any of you ever majored in, and those people are scrubbed away, substituted for deep thinking, profound thinking, are thoughts by mediocre folks who are elevated to sainthood, metaphorically speaking, because they have the right gender, or race, or ethnicity. So, instead of a Shakespeare, you'll get some indigenous person from Guatemala who may be very smart, but they're only selected based on their ethnicity, color, or gender. That is what makes them legitimate in the minds of the administrators of this place. De Tocqueville said, and I've used this quote too often, but I think it's one of the better quotes, and you've heard it before. He said that the species of oppression by which democratic nations is menaced is unlike anything which ever before existed in the world. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people until each nation becomes nothing more than a flock of timid animals. Timid animals, of which the government is the shepherd. He said that nearly 200 years ago. Now, much smarter than me, which is not a heavy lift, but I would quibble with him on one aspect of it. He says, it does not tyrannize, but it does. 
Remember when George Bush said about 20 years ago, he talked about the soft bigotry of low expectations? Well, what we're experiencing is the soft tyranny of political correctness. It's not the tyranny of Mao or Stalin or Hitler, but it's a tyranny nonetheless. I bet you many of you have refrained from speaking your mind when you should have, possibly, because of fear of public opprobrium from our cultural betters, from our elites. I know sometimes I hold my tongue because I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to be the victim of the hordes on Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Now, I hardly ever hold my tongue that long. Sometimes it just happens. But we all know the fear of saying the wrong thing and being ostracized at bare minimum from polite society and very often losing your jobs, just as I mentioned with K. Cole James and Roger Scruton. If giants like that can lose their jobs, anybody can. Not overt tyranny, as I said before. Rather, you remember Robert Bork? One of the premier jurists in American history, not just in the last three years, but in American history. He wrote a book called Slouching Toward the Moral. So it's a tyranny that's not brought, it's not overt, but we're kind of slouching toward it, almost imperceptible. We don't even know it's happening, like the frog in the pot on the stove. But it is happening. And for those of us of a certain age, and I've been around here for 65 years now, you remember where we were a long time ago, and you remember where we are now, or you know where we are now, and you've seen that slow slouching toward the more. And in large part, it's the result of the failure of our educational institutions to impart the types of wisdoms that the Lyceum imparts. The great authors, the great thinkers, the great philosophers who are now consigned to the dustbin of history because they're not the right gender, they're not the right race. The validity and truth of what they say, the wisdom of what they say, is secondary to what they represent or who they may feel good in terms of inclusion or some other contemporary or preferred term. Where you have a derogation of these verities of classical education, you have inexorable decline in ordered liberty. What our founding fathers had created for us, ordered liberty. It doesn't mean license, but it means an ordered set of precepts that throughout history has been found to be, frankly, true and would promote a just society. Now, this didn't emerge spring from the forehead of some great genius. It was the result of our religion. Not just Catholicism, okay, but is mainly a function of the Judeo-Christian ethic of Western civilization. I am prejudiced and biased, but I think Catholicism is the essence of it. If you don't have the ability to read those great minds, if that is suppressed and we're starting to listen to people only on the basis of what they represent and that they are approved by our cultural betters, you have a decline in the ability to think in a natural progression toward corruption, broadly said. Corruption in terms of our institutions, and we see it. For all of you out here who are older than 50 years old, you have seen the slouch that Bork talked about. Every one of our institutions, from our government, to our businesses, to the media, schools, and God forbid, even our families. A corruption. No longer hewing to honest principles but rather making deals, mediating certain aspects of society. We're teaching facts but not truths, because truth is offensive. How did we get to this point where truth is offensive? And again, I see it on the Civil Rights Commission all the time where I'm being asked to accept 
was palpably false because it serves a particular agenda, usually a political agenda. And we're permitting this to happen. Americans never used to permit that to happen. But when you have a decline, a gradual slouch in our education, so it doesn't embody the classic precepts that the Lyceum imparts to its students, this is a natural result. And it's alarming. We should all be alarmed. I've been talking long enough, so I just want to say a few things. I will implore you very humbly. But I see it as a phenomenal institution. We, I would support it at any time that I can, and any other institution like it. But we also, all of us, I think, have a responsibility to our fellow man, to the United States of America, most importantly to God, to resist the purging of religion from the public square and from our schools. <laughs> we need to resist the rewriting of history or the elimination of history entirely. If you forget what your history has been, you don't know the direction in which you're going. Resist the denigration of the great philosophers that the Lyceum teaches every day, the founding fathers who are being made out to be horrible individuals who are racists and homophobes and everything else. These are the founding fathers. Every single human being except one throughout history has been flawed. Yet they're purging these giants who created the greatest nation on earth. I'd much rather purge Bill Maurer, for example. <laughs> I'm still not sure what he's contributed. The denigration of Western civilization in general. I heard a politician talk about English law and saying that we needed to abandon English law because it was white man's law. Understand something. This is a politician, a prominent politician in the United States of America, who said we needed to abandon English law, white man's law. So, are you prepared to abandon free speech, freedom of religion, due process, equal protection? These were all English law, or English-based law, and purported white man's law. But we're getting to that point. Watch closely what is happening. The denial of due process. The denial of freedom of religion. It's happening slowly, like the frog in the pot, but it is happening. So, resist all of these things that are being foisted upon us by people who, however well-meaning, are wrong. They have, unfortunately, been the victims of the lack of a classical education such as imparted by the Lyceum. Resist the dismantling of the building blocks, the foundation of Western civilization, and most importantly, the United States of America. Otherwise, we lose America. And if we lose America, this world will be a very dark place. One thing I do know is that as long as there are institutions like Lutz, like the Lyceum, like all those kids back there, that isn't going to happen because every single one of those kids standing back there is worth 100 of the senators and congressmen and media folks and all the other people that would erase in a row what's great about this country, what's great about Western civilization, what's great about Catholicism. Thank you very much. <laughs>